Good morning and welcome to another tech training by me, Andy. Um, the training today is going to be uh, revolving around the maintenance of uh, of uh, troubleshooting. Um, and some of the troubleshooting will be quite in depth, especially for the new uh, repair centers that uh, will be um, op will be opening up around the country. So if you are, um, you know, if you feel that maybe this is too deep leveled training for you, then you're welcome to um, just request for the recording or you can stay around for the rest of the of the uh, presentation. Okay, so um, I'm just going to bring up the screen. Stand by for me one second. Okay, I'm also going to open up chats uh, where you can post your your questions. Um, and in the last 10 minutes of uh, the training session, which will be at about 10 to 11, uh, we'll go through the questions in there and I'll try and answer the questions as best I can. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, let's get straight into the, into the presentation. Okay, so um, particularly we're going to be talking about the, 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 the SNA, um, the opening slide was based on the SNA six kilowatt. Sorry, can, it, can everybody see my screen? Um, is the uh, you maybe just type a message and tell me if the screen if the sh screen sharing uh, is it has jumped to the next page? Right. So the first uh, the first one we're going to look at is the scenario when your grid power is on the EPS load works, but when the grid power is out or off, then there is no EPS output. So basically what, 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 what we're saying here in this scenario is that when uh, the grid is on, that we have bypass current or throughput current. So the power is coming in from ESCOM and it's going out on the EPS, it's all good. But the minute you switch the grid off or if there's a grid outage, we have no EPS output. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the battery status, right? So here on the screen, this is a little screen grab of what the uh, monitoring screen looks like here. And in, in the bottom left-hand corner, it will show you the battery uh, information. The first thing that we're looking at is this is a, a scenario where you have a lithium battery connected with communication. So lithium with communication here. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to check if the battery discharge is allowed or not, number one. And then you're going to have a look at the battery uh, SOC on the BMS side. So that means we're going to have to jump into the settings and have a look at the uh, go to the, to the maintenance page. And we're going to have a look at the um, voltage of the battery and make sure that the on grid cutoff and the off grid cutoff are set to the desired values that you want to set it to. Okay. Then uh, if we're working with a, a lithium battery with or without communication, which means that we're using it in the lead acid mode, we're going to check if the battery discharge is allowed and the battery discharge cut of SOC or the voltage, if you've set it at voltage level. And here you can see in the settings of the page, we're going to have to make sure that the, 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 uh, the cut of voltages are set correctly. Uh, sorry, I'm going to just make sure that everybody's muted. Somebody's... Um, it's Alex. All right. So, uh, yeah. So you're going to make sure that the the battery discharge is allowed and that the battery discharge cut of FSC has been reached. If we don't, if if this, if we go past this level here, um, then we're going to go to the next stage. And we're going to make sure that there is no loose connection issue on the battery input. Remember that your battery cables that come up from the batteries uh, and connect to the inverter. There are two um, uh, studs there with uh, two locking bolts that go over the over the uh, the cable um, uh, ends that connect the, the batteries to the to the battery terminal on the on the inverter. So we've got to make sure that these are tightened properly. Uh, because you must remember that you can sample voltage over a very, very thin area. You know, you can sample voltage over a, a, a strand of copper, but you can't carry current or load over it. So make sure that the, that the uh, there's no loose connection issue. 
And then you're also going to check that if the two sampling values are the same. So this page here is from our data page and or the data history page. And here we're going to go to the BMS firm, BMS firm, the, 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 uh, the BMS uh, voltage. And here we represented, this is represented in uh, without any decimal. So 472 basically means 47.2 volts. And here it's 49.8, 481, you know, 50.7. So we can to look at these two values here, or alternatively, we can go all the way to the to the left, and we will also see there we have so here we have V bat I and V, and on the extreme left, you're going to have a column which is V bat. So you can also check that this column voltage and the one on that side are exactly the same. And if the sampling voltage values are less than 38 volts, and just check that that the battery in cables are correct and also you're going to use uh, your multimeter and check the battery output as well to make sure that you're getting voltage on the battery output okay so if you have lithium with uh, once again in lead acid mode um, make sure that the battery voltage using the multimeter we just spoke about that now and also check if the battery voltage of the EMS FW update in this here refers to this column here is close to the real voltage and select according to the internal voltage here. So, so basically what I'm going to do is I will show you, you see here we have a screen grab at the bottom here. What we can do is we can do battery voltage sampling according to, we have internal, we have external, and we have both. Particularly the machines chip with both, where we, where we use both the internal and the external sampling. If you have a sampling issue, uh, especially you guys that work in support, um, you can ask the installer or the installer can do it himself, is measure the actual nominal voltage across the battery terminals, which should be, which will be this voltage here. And then you can also measure, and then this here in the V bat I and V is our sampling voltage. And if there's a difference here or discrepancy, and you, you'll find which one is correct. If, 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 the, if the inverter sampling on the terminal is correct, then you're going to use internal. Or if the battery voltage is correct and the inverter sampling is incorrect, then you're going to use external. You're just going to choose which one is the, the closest and then select according to um, the correct one, okay? Um, then you're going to also check the, v, the bus two voltage reading. Now the bus two voltage here is in this column here. Now the, for the SNA, the bus two voltage reading, when the, when the DC to DC circuit is working, the equation should be like this. For the SNA six, the ratio is seven times. In other words, you're going to take your battery voltage. Let's assume that the battery voltage is 50 volts. The nominal voltage is 50. Then we're going to multiply it by a factor of seven. And the bus two voltage reading in this column should be 350 volts. Seven times 50 is 350. And that's what we should get. If we get that value on an SNA6, then we know that the DC to DC circuit is working perfectly. On the SNA5, the ratio here, the multiplier will be six. We will have 50 times six. We should have a voltage here of 300 volts. And that's how we determine um, that the V bus two voltage is correct. And uh, the V bus two voltage will be a little bit higher than, than, uh, than, so let's just go back to the previous one. Um, then if, it, if there is a problem, then you will know that uh, we need to attend to that particular side there. The, I'm going to see if I can jump back. So when to make sure that, uh, let me move this out of the way. Let's put it up here. Make sure that the DC, to DC circuit works and it works with the correct ratio. So remember, on the SNA6, the, the multiplier is seven times the nominal voltage of the battery. And on the SNA5, it will be six times the nominal voltage of the battery. Okay. If, if this is incorrect and it's not working, then it simply means that the DC to DC circuit is not working and the machine will have to come in for repairs. All right. So then you're going to check the on and off on off grid relay, uh, which is the output relay, and you're going to, you know, check and see if it's making a clicking sound. So the step step one and step two is passed. Remember, we just went through that now. We're going to check the battery terminals and we're also going to check the VBUS2 voltage. If you pass those two steps and there is no relay clicking sound, 
then the on-off grid relay may have a problem. And it could also be that the driver circuit issue, which controls this particular relay, doesn't reach the, the so the signal, the control signal doesn't reach the, the relay, or the relay itself could be in a state of failure. So um, if we consider the driver circuit issue, then the connection of the flat cable between the main board and the control board should be checked. Uh, and for, for installers, you guys won't get to see this because you obviously don't get to open up machines. But for our repair centers, um, this is where it, it uh, they do an in-depth check on it. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail for um, on the repair shop side because that training we will be giving more in-depth to the, the uh, technicians who work on the machines. But basically what they would then do is and they would open up the machine and they will check that the the, the uh, communication ribbon between the control board and the main board, there are two of them, uh, that they are securely connected. And they could also check and see if the relays are functioning. And that typically how they would do that is they would test it with an external power source to make sure that the relays are clicking, uh, engaging or not, because they use a 12 volt supply on that. Okay, then we're going to check the status of the integrated EPS switch. Remember, this is the switch here at the bottom. Underneath your inverter, you have over there, that's the power switch where my cursor is circling. Um, this here is a 40 amp pop-out relay uh, and the neutral of the grid runs through here, of our grid supply runs through there. And then this one here is basically a switch which runs, which runs off this board that sits behind here, the interface board. Uh, and it's basically just a 12 volt uh, power that we're switching here to engage the relay, okay? When the EPS switch is off, the output relay, RY1, which is this one here, and the grid bypass or pass-through relays will be in the off status, okay? So, so these here that, that pass through here, uh, sorry, here, RY5 and RY1 will be in the off state if this particular switch is off. And remember, guys, that when you do your uh, your um, um, software updates, if there is no PV available, then you have to have the EPS switch in the on state because that will allow you to do the uh, MPPT update. Um, because if there is no voltage sitting on the uh, MPPT, then uh, that particular microprocessor will not be powered for uh, firmware updates. So please, guys, when you do firmware updates, always make sure that your EPS switch is on regardless of whether you've got PV or not. But in the case of, in the absence of PV and this is off, the MPPT update will not go through. All right, so then we're going to check the EPS output status on the LCD display. And here, this is where we're going to see it. So on the screen of the SNA, this is the five and the six. We have a screen that looks like this. So here, we're going to see whether the EPS output is enabled or if it is disabled. And typically, when you switch the EPS switch on, um, when you switch the switch on here, then, then the, status here should, the status here should change. The status here should change. Okay, I'm just going to have to once again check and see who is not muted because we're getting some feedback here. Sorry, I'm having a very strong go back here. I can barely hear what you're saying. Guys, I'm going to ask you again, please make sure that your microphones are muted and stay muted. Um, we're getting feedback here. I'm going to mute all again. Mute all current and new participants, yes. Um, it becomes a, a distraction for our recording and also for those who are currently in. Um... Yeah, okay. Okay. So here we're going to check and see that the the uh, EPS is disabled or enabled. We got to make sure of that, right? And if this doesn't come true, then it simply means that we have an internal problem. Okay. The cable inside the inverters can be connected, so we have to check uh, the cable of the switch to the interface board, which is that very this very switch here. The switch here, it's just a two-wire cable that comes in. Here yeah, you can see it running along here, and it plugs into the top of the interface board there. And then we 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 the switch itself could also have malfunction. And sometimes then our repair center will have to change the switch. It's very rare. I've never in, in all of my time working with the SNA have I seen um, a switch that needs to be replaced. But then again, 
I haven't done uh, many repairs myself. Okay, so then we're going to check the status of the integrated circuit breaker. Now remember, this particular picture here is on the uh, the US version, and you know where the switch is on the outside. But I'm just going to go back to this particular switch here. So here we have the power switch in this corner, which this is the switch that powers the inverter on and off. And then here we have a 40 amp pop out fuse. So we're referring in this particular part of the troubleshooting. Here we're referring to this pop-out switch, and sometimes the button trips due to the overload or over current protection. If that button trips, it's literally a pop-out switch. You simply just have to push it back in again, uh, and then the continuity of the two pins inside there will uh, close the circuit, uh, and then we will have um, power again. So that's the other thing that you're going to check. Then also we're going to check the connection between the load consumption and the internal terminals. Sometimes... So on the on the inside of the machine, you know where your uh, where the grid feed comes in. It goes into a connector block, and also your EPS coming out. We have to confirm. In obviously, you're going to make sure that your inverter is in the off state. You're going to confirm that those uh, screws that are holding down the cables are tight. And then for the technicians as well, you've got to check the back end of those connector blocks and make sure that possibly the cables going from there to the internal of the machine, which two of them will go to the MOV board and then they go down to the main and the, the gen ones go to the back end of the of the main board, you're going to have to check and see that those screws are tight because a loop connection there will give us a reading, a false reading like this. Here you can see that the 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 UPS voltage is only 115 volts. A loose connection could uh, cause this here. So uh, typically that's the next step we're going to do. We're going to look at things like that. And if that's if all of those things are correct, then obviously the machine has to come in for uh, further repairs. Right, We're also going to check the grid input voltage reading uh, and make sure that the actual reading that we are getting off the uh, municipal feed, the nominal voltage there on the AC side is correct, and that it's exactly the same on top of the connector blocks inside the machine. But there may be a grid... So either there's a grid sampling issue where the grid in, is in fact incorrect and the machine will then go to off-grid mode, or it could possibly be that the um, the connector block terminals uh, are loose. Okay, and then if all the steps don't work, in other words, all of the steps from one to five, they don't work, then the inverter might suffer from a surge damage. And then you please have to bring it in for inspection. And unfortunately, on the especially on the high felt, we have this with the high incidence of uh, lightning and um, uh, you know electrical storms, as well as a, a an unstable grid and surges coming through from the grid. We do get we do especially in the in on the high felt, we see a lot of machines coming back with damage uh, surge protect uh, surges to the main board. And this is why we have to. Um, we have to stipulate and that your as an installer, you have to make sure that your surge protection is adequate. In other words, make sure that you're using uh, the correct top certified um, AC uh, surge protection on the AC feed coming in. And if you can uh, also use a, um, a relay type over an under voltage uh, breaker, um, which will allow for, um, even though the, the inverter can do this type of protection by itself, it just means that you're adding an extra protection before um, the power gets to the inverter. So that if the circuit voltage, uh, when I say circuit voltage, I'm talking about the, the mains uh, feed from ESCOM or from your, from your uh, municipal um, external supplier, if the voltage is over a certain range or under a certain range or the frequency is over or under, then the relay will disengage. Uh, it's just extra protection that you can add in. And it for you as an installer, it just creates so much more peace of mind knowing that you've added the extra protection, obviously at an extra cost to your customer, but it's peace of mind um, knowing that you, uh, you, you know, you're not going to get unnecessary uh, call outs. And then if there's no uh, damage marked, uh, you know, on, on especially the MOV board or the main board, then um, the control board has to be checked and replaced. All right, so here we're going to look at the next one, which is fault number two. Now, remember that our machines come with, uh, I'm just going to go back to the screen here. 
Here you can see there is a warning face and you can see there's a fault face. Sorry, that's normal, but over here, I'm gonna go back to the previous one here. Here we have a fault face, we have a warning face and we have a normal face, okay? So this is normally illuminated when the machine is running and then it will also have a code in here as well as up here. All right, and that's just a working mode. So if you have normal and a number in here, or you have the SRA number up here, it simply just uh, it's the working mode of the inverter. And inside the manual, there is a reference to the working modes. So as installers or end users, you have to make sure that when you report a fault, the guys in the tech support center will always ask you, what fault are you getting? You have to, if it's a warning and a code, you have to tell them it's a W, 08. Or if it's a fault, you have to say it's an F code and 08. Or this is just the LCD numbering here. You have to tell them warning and the number or fault and the number. Okay. Don't just say it's a it's a uh, it's a, a code zero zero because we have a fault code zero zero and we have a warning code zero zero. So just make sure that you use the correct uh, terminology. Okay, so here we're going to talk about fault codes, right? So um, this one is fault 02, and basically what it means is that we have a um, we have anti-reverse MOS fail. So here we're going to do, we're going to check the internal and external battery voltage reading. So once again, we spoke about it earlier. We're going to have a look at this voltage here, which is the sampling voltage, and this one here. This one comes from the BMS, and this is what we are sampling here. The software engineer uses this particular column here. Upload battery terminal, uh, battery internal voltage sampling, and V bat INV is the external battery voltage one, which one is this here. So this is what we are measuring. We're physically measuring this nominal voltage across the battery terminals. And this here is the uploaded BMS voltage that the software engineer uses. And typically, normally, uh, both of the, the internal and the external voltage sampling issues, voltages should be the same. If they are different, then there should be an issue with the sampling, and then we have to try and correct them. Remember, we showed you earlier on that you can use internal or external, um, or both, to, to use your sampling. But obviously, check which one is correct, and then use that one. Um, and if you have a multimeter, please check the real value of the battery by measuring the nominal voltage across the terminals, and then you can adjust it. Uh, or you just check online, and please compare these two values to the BMS value as well, okay? Okay, so step one, uh, to disable uh, the abnormal, abnormal, abnormal sampling channel. Remember, we spoke about this earlier. It's here. It's on the settings page. Uh, under other settings, you're going to go here to the battery sampling. You'll click this for the drop-down menu, and you're going to – obviously, you, you would have measured first. So you're first going to measure the battery nominal voltage. If the battery's nominal voltage is correct, then you're going to select external or – if, it, if the inverter's sampling is correct, but the battery is incorrect, then you're going to select internal. If they are both the same, then you can leave it on the default, which is both available. But here's a very important thing here. The abnormal issue of battery sampling voltage may also be related to, with battery voltage high, battery voltage low, and battery open issue, okay? And obviously we know this here, we've, all of us have, in, uh, have experienced this where you have uh, either the battery voltage is too high, where the, the, the uh, upper end of the, the voltage has been as overshot, or the battery voltage is too low, uh, or it could be that the, uh, the battery BMS, um, the, the, uh, the output of the battery has been opened due to uh, either uh, over voltage or over current, not over voltage, but especially over current. If you are running in off-grid mode and you uh, try and, um, discharge the battery to, at a too high of a current, then the um, the protection will kick in and it'll it will open the circuit. Uh, so even though the battery is outputting uh, information on the BMS, there's no power coming out uh, because it's in protection mode. And then you simply have to follow the battery manufacturer's recommendations on how to reset the battery. Okay, so here we're going to look at another common fault that we get. We've been seeing a lot of lately. We're getting faults 28, 29. Sync signal trigger lost in a parallel system. Okay, so um, let's quickly discuss how the parallel communication works in the SNA. So remember that we have our parallel ports underneath the inverter. Um, 
and uh, we can see it. It's on the on the uh, it's RJ45 plugs. It's the, the two back ones, and they are simply marked parallel, and it's got a, a parallel markings as long with a little line on there to show you, um, you know, how they are connected. Um, it's an eight pin uh, port, and here are the definitions for the eight pins. Okay, so um, this is quite interesting to know. And pin number five is the slave, parallel sync trigger signal for work mode switching. And pin number six is the master competition. And then obviously, you know, I'm not going to go into all of these details, but let's look at what the faults mean. The fault 28 will occur if the sub inverter fails to receive the sync signal for more than 300 milliseconds. In other words, the slave inverter fails to receive a synchronizing signal from the master for more than 0.3 of a second. And how to remove it after having received the sync signal. Uh, and in other words, after five seconds of having received the correct signal from the master, the fault 28 will go away by itself. Fault 29 will occur um, after having received the sync switching status demand. The inverter doesn't receive the sync triggering signal in 40 milliseconds. So, in other words, between the two, there should be a synchronization switching uh, signal between the two. And I'll, we'll go into it in detail in the next slide, because here we're talking about, you must remember, in a parallel uh, uh, connection, we have two inverters where they are sharing the output of the live and the neutral. So it's very important for the master to control all of the slaves to make sure that the phase angle of the live as well as the neutral are synchronized. They have to be exactly synchronized or overlaid across each other 100%. They cannot be off by a couple of degrees. And this is what uh, this fault 28 and 29 refers to, that the sync synchronization signal and the trigger signal has been lost. And the reason well, what will then happen is once that happens, the output will be cut uh, and it's a safety feature because you cannot have output of uh, it, of your your single phase or even in a three phase where the phase angle or the sine wave is offset in any uh, manner or form, be it on voltage or on frequency. Okay, so uh, continuing on from that, the related parts of these two issues. Uh, let me just move this out of the way. Parallel communication cable, interface board, flat cable between the interface board and the control board. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to check, in a case like that with the Pol 28 and Pol 29, we're going to check the parallel communication cable. We're going to make sure, because the SNA requires a normal straight straight 8-pin cable, and it must be the 8-pin, full 8-pin full network cable to work, to ensure that all the pins are well connected to the inverters. And sometimes the pins become inelastic. In other words, if you look inside the pin, it's a plastic housing, but it's got those brass pins which are which come out like this, and then they bend up. And sometimes those pins, they lose their, their um, you know, obviously in here we say elasticity, but it, they lose their spring, spring effect, and they are not pushing down on the contacts inside the inverter itself, because inside the inverter, you have the reverse of that. You've got those brass pins coming up and bending like this. And sometimes they lose their spring effect and they don't make contact with the pins inside um, the, the, the actual RJ45. So just make sure that there's no dirt inside there. Sometimes we get a piece of, um, you know, guys, they drill through plastic or through the, uh, the, um, uh, channeling uh, and a bit of a plastic will in inadvertently find its way inside there or you might get an insect inside there and it prevents one or more of the pins from making contact. So just make sure that that is clean and that all the pins are standing at the same height. Step one and step two are good. Then it could be the internal connection issue and the fault shows for the slave unit. Then you need a third unit to troubleshoot this issue. So basically then take, leave the master in its place uh, and put another unit there. If you've got three units in parallel, it's great because you can eliminate the middle one altogether. Just connect the first one and the last in parallel and see if the problem still uh, exists. Or alternatively, you've got to uh, exchange the slave for another one, do the troubleshooting again, and then see if the problem uh, occurs again. Um, and then you're going to check the parallel communication uh, for every two units and find the abnormal one. And then obviously that one will either you can find the problem on site or alternatively, the machine is going to come in for repairs. 
Um, you can interface board in the flat ribbon cable. Um, the, the, this is not typically something that you guys can do on site, but the, we could also replace the interface board or the flat cable that runs between the interface board and the control board. Uh, and typically that will solve the problem. But once again, that's a uh, step where the machines are coming for repairs. And then for the guys who are running, working in the, the repair centers, we've got to check the control board. So in other words, if we failed, if we pass step one, two, three, and four, uh, then um, if those are all good, then the control board has to be replaced. And unfortunately, that means the machine's got to come in for repairs. The control board's got to be replaced. And then also, the guys have got to reset the serial number on the control board. Okay, so, um, and that's, please remember to override the serial number for the inverter using the serial port cable or the PC tool on the W local connect. Uh, and that's only something that the guys at uh, the workshop level can do. Okay, um, fault 28 occurs when the comm data is lost for more than five seconds and to remove it, there's a correct and continuous communication for five seconds. Um, so, you know, the related parts with these two issues um, is the parallel communication, the interface board, the flat cable between the interface board and the control board and the control board itself. Okay. Um, so I'm going to jump across to the next one. Um, and once again, here we are doing exactly the same. Uh, ex it's exactly the same as the previous setup. So we're just going to hop through that. I want to make sure that. Okay, so here we're going to go to fault 13, which is a UPS reverse current. So this fault occurs in a parallel system only. This only refers to a parallel system. And typically what will happen here is in a parallel system, the reverse power of more than 600 watts for 200 or 0.2 of a second or 800 watts for 20 milliseconds. Uh, to remove this fault, simply restart the inverters. But what causes this? So you, it could be a parallel communication fault. Um, once again, remember, we spoke about the sync trigger. Uh, the master and the slaves have to be working in unison so that the output power on the EPS side, the uh, the sine wave, have to overlap each other 100%. The phase angle, the voltage, everything has to be exactly the same. And typically, if they are slightly out, then you will find that one inverter is getting feedback on the EPS line. And that's typically what fault 13 refers to. It's the UPS reverse current. So in other words, one of the machines is getting a reverse current feedback on the EPS side. So we've got to check that both inverters are set to the parallel mode. You know, one phase parallel or three phase parallel. Make sure that, that uh, units are not working as a master with this. With the SNA, it's very difficult to get this point here because they are self-assigning masters. In other words, when you switch on, if you build a system and you switch it on, you're going to switch them on one at a time because the first machine that comes on will assign itself as the master and then the rest of them will be subordinate. Um, and the phase angle of the, the EPS output will be different and that will cause the reverse current. Uh, and sometimes also a bus high voltage issue will, uh, may occur for this particular problem here. And then the third step is we've got to check for two units in parallel connection that they have the EPS live and neutral are shared. So in other words, that you don't have the live of one connected to the neutral of the other uh, at downstream on your uh, on your EPS output board. Uh, that could also cause a reverse current issue, in which case the output will be cut until you resolve the issue. Okay. Um, Fault number 20, EPS connection fault. Uh, so here, what we're going to do is, this fault occurs in a non-parallel system. But before going to backup mode, the, the EPS RMS voltage, or the, 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 the RMS voltage is higher than 10 volts for one second, every two seconds, and average voltage is, higher, is lower than three volts. Um, so the, the, the fault will remove itself before going to backup mode, the EPS RMS voltage is lower than 10 volts for so basically just giving you the criteria for when it will change and how to uh, rectify this fault. Uh, check if it is a parallel system without communication. If two inverters are in parallel connection and the parallel communication doesn't work properly because the parallel communication are not configured correctly, please make sure that both inverter you are set to the same phase. In other words, to single phase or parallel or three phase parallel.
Okay, so fault zero zero. Remember, I spoke to you earlier. I said you be, we have fault zero zero and we have warning zero zero. Okay, so fault zero zero occurs when the comms CPU fails to receive data from the control CPU for five seconds, and to remove it, obviously, it gets the data back again uh, continuously for two seconds. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to make sure that uh, it only happens when the firm. Uh, if it happened only when the firmware update is done, in other words, if you have if you didn't have this fault before the update and then after the update you have the fault then it could be the issue of the dsp control firmware that has was removed but was never uh, updated simply what you can then do is restart the inverter and then download the dsp control firmware again force it to download that again um, and that normally fixes the the, the issue you know um we we seem to be having a trend of regular firmware updates now people are looking for updates all the time and trying to update the inverters guys we're not working with mobile phones here you don't need the latest firmware all the time we have machines out in the field that are still running on the original firmware that was installed three years ago the only time that we suggest you do updates is when you have a particular problem on your machine that you want to fix and there is a firmware update fix for it or a bug fix for it then do the update by all means or alternatively if there's an advancement in the in the performance of the machine like we did recently a couple of months ago we upgraded the mppt outputs of the uh, snas to 17 amps um, and then by all means do it but if you don't need to do updates and your machines are working fine in the field don't cause problems for yourself and look for updates all the time. It's just, it becomes a nightmare. Um, it, typically because um, you, you're changing the, 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 the logic environment of the machine when it required nothing more. You know, it, it had been working fine. So I, I strongly recommend that you don't force updates on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, just because there are updates available. Um, you know, the firmware that's been working for months or years doesn't have to be changed unless, of course, there's a, um, a specific reason why you want to change it. Okay, so uh, internal fault uh, communication. So you can step two, check if it could be removed after a hard reset of the inverter. Um, or alternatively, we would have to go to step three for a full further inspection. So if you did do a hard reset and the fault could be removed and we could check for other mechanisms which were triggered such as turning on the generator and the generator had, had a high frequency fluctuation and then you know you're going to simply um, update the inverter with a new firmware version or you can request that we roll back the firmware to the previous version that you were running okay um, and if neither step one or step two works then it could be the power supply issue or communication circuit issue and then you need to have a further inspection which means the machine has to come in for repairs um, okay, so I'm not going to go through this particular part here because it refers to the guys in the workshop, but typically it's called for a, a control board replacement and then to make sure that the new control board is updated with the existing uh, inverted um, serial number. All right, uh, fault 17, in, internal communication fault 2. Many of us have seen this before. And basically what it's talking about here is the bus voltage is higher than 150 volts and the MPPT SPS so the SPS is a power supply. It's working, but the COM CPU fails to receive the COM data from the MPPT CPU or received abnormal data for five seconds. And typically this will rectify itself if the, if the COM CPU manages to receive normal data for more than two seconds. Um, and the related parts for this, once again, for you guys that are doing tech repairs, just remember that the flat cable between the MPPT control board, the MPPT board and the control board uh, is good. Um, the, those are the ones you're going to check. And uh, typically on the older machines, we had that little uh, where the ribbon cable goes in and a little flap that clips up. Just make sure that uh, the silicone um, sealer or the glue that holds the clip down hasn't come loose. Alternatively, you can remove that, open it, and make sure that the, the ribbon goes in square and all the way to the end before clipping it down and re-gluing it again. The newer machines uh, are more robust because they come with a much more robust uh, uh, a mechanical clip uh, to lock these rib uh, communication ribbons in place, as well as, and I think I spoke about this in our previous one of our previous uh, sessions, it also comes with a, um, a much thicker coating 
of uh, corrosion resistance, which is going to be great for um, uh, the guys that are using it in high humidity and coastal areas. Okay, internal fault 17, in, internal communication fault 2. Uh, and yeah, you've got to do is you've got to check if it happened only when the firmware update was done. If it worked normally before the firmware update, and after the MPPT firmware update is done, the fault occurs, then it could be the issue that the fir MPPT firmware has been erased from the chip. So please just restart the inverter and update the inverter with the MPPT firmware again. Remember, um, when we do updates, we have uh, typically there's the M3 and a DSP firmware, but there's also the MPPT firmware that needs to go through. And remember, I told you that if there is insufficient PV or if there's no VBUS one voltage uh, coming from PV uh, and you've got the uh, EPS switch off, then the MPPT firmware won't load. Uh, so guys, remember, especially for you guys who are sitting on your couch or lying in bed and pushing updates, um, if there is no power on the MPPT, then the update won't go through and then you could eventually end up with an internal communication fault too. All right, and then the other thing to do is to check uh, if it can be removed after a hard reset. Uh, if you did a hard reset and the fault code could be removed, then we could check for other mechanisms, not be removed, then you can check for other mechanisms. Uh, that were triggered and please just adjust the update uh please just update the inverter with a new firmware version yeah uh, so, um i'm just going to hey guys i just have to communicate with somebody before they uh walked out um, let's go back to okay, so let's go back here. Fault 17, um, if after step one and step two doesn't work, then it could be the power supply issue or the communication circuit issue. Remember, yeah, if we're talking about power supply issue, we've got SPS both on the main board and on the uh, MPPD board, there are, are, are SPS boards or, or power supplies. And it could be uh, either that or it could be a communication circuit issue. And then for the technicians, you know, this is something that they have to do on a further inspection. They will check for defective parts and they will follow the steps, the flat table, the control board and the MPPD board. I must say that the, the SNA's MPPD board is probably one of the most robust boards in that machine uh, other than the MOV board. Um, the, the, the most or the, the least replaced boards is the MOV and then following that is the MPPT. Uh, in the service centers, we very, very rarely see the MPPT boards damaged, unless, of course, the guys have done something really crazy with them or they get a, a direct lightning strike or surge. Uh, we've seen some uh, some pretty badly damaged MPPTs, but they are so rare. Uh, so the guys uh, you know, at our R&D uh, facility, I know that our MPPT board is probably one of the most robust things that, we, uh, that we've built. Again, once again, guys, just remember that if you replace the control board, it's very important to remember to override the serial number. Otherwise, your machine will go out with a serial number that's just 10 X's. Okay, so if you've got a machine that you've received back from our uh, support center or our repair centers and it's still got the old uh, 10 X serial number, just call into our, um, our uh, support center. Um, or either you can, if you've got the guys, the tech support guys, you've got their direct numbers, or if you can reach out to them on the uh, WhatsApp channel um, and just give us the dongle serial number, we'll be able to change the inverter serial number to the correct one uh, remotely. Okay, fault 18 is internal communication fault three. So this occurs when the control CPU fails to receive communication data from the POM CPU or it receives abnormal data for more than 500 milliseconds or half a second. Uh, it can be removed if it's the correct data for five seconds. However, if it still continues, then the related parts that are needed to be able to look at is the SPS on the main board, the flat table between the main board and the control board, and the control board itself. Um, step one, check if you've got Wi-Fi connection and the LCD display works properly. If the Wi-Fi connection and the LCD display works normally and there is a fault 18, 
then it means that the problem will be with the communication circuit between the COM CPU and the control CPU. Alternatively, if the Wi-Fi communicate connection and the LCD display and the spring buttons don't respond, then it could be the problem of the SPS, the SPS on the main board. And unfortunately, if it's that, then we have to replace the main board because we simply cannot replace the SPS on its own. All right, um, step two, if step one is passed, if, you know, if it works, then you're going to have to check and see if it can be removed after a hard reset to the inverter. So if you've done a hard reset and the fault code could not be removed, then we could check if the other mechanisms were triggered. And then obviously you're going to have to update the inverter and run with the new firmware version. But this here, remember this updating and new firmware versions, it's the last resort, okay? It's not a silver bullet or a miracle cure. Okay, and then step three, have a further inspection. And once again, this now refers to our guys in the repair centers. If neither step one and two works, and it could be possibly that the SPS or the communication circuit issue, you need to have a further inspection there and you could take the related part. And remember, once again, they're drawing your attention here to the control board. If you're going to change it, make sure that you add or overwrite the default NX serial number with the serial number on the side of the chassis. Okay. Um, and then fault 19, bus voltage high. Bus voltage, bus voltage high refers, if bus voltage occurs in the, the bus, one voltage is higher than 495. So what is bus voltage one? Remember, we spoke earlier on about VBUS2. So VBUS2 refers to the bus voltage of the DC to DC circuit from the battery. Remember, with the SNA6, we're using a factor of seven. So if the nominal voltage of the battery is 50 on bus 2, then it will be 50 times the multiplier of 7. It's 350. That's the bus voltage 2 we're looking for. Bus voltage 1 refers to PV. If you have PV connected, then we're going to have bus 1 voltage. And the bus 1 voltage is normally a ratio of 1 to 1 with the, uh, with the uh, PV voltage. And if it's higher than 490 volts for 10 milliseconds or bus 2 voltage is higher than 465 for 10, 40 milliseconds, then uh, we're going to have this fault. And then simply once it lowers to these values here, then uh, we're going to have uh, the fault will be removed. If it doesn't happen, then it could be related with these issues. The PV input voltage is too high. Uh, you know, when we when we change the MPPT um, um, specifications with a new update where we could go from 13 to 17 amps and we also allowed for a much higher uh, wattage which was uh, we went from 3.3 kilowatts to 4 kilowatts per MPPT input a lot of guys had a mistake made the mistake where they thought that they could simply just up the voltage as well but it doesn't really work like that right so so you must remember that here on this the diagram here shows you where we are measuring the, the, the VBUS2 and the VBUS1 voltage. So the, this bus voltage high issue could be related to the PV input voltage is too high. Remember that we, we're targeting a closed circuit voltage of about 380 volts. Okay, open circuit can be um, higher than that, could be 480, but once there is once the circuit is closed and, closed and there's load connected, the amp Current will go up and the voltage should come down, and we're looking for a target of around uh, 380 volts connected voltage at full load. Um, the current output is limited, or the surge current at, or the reverse current issue happens. But these are the three factors that could cause a bus voltage high. All right, but typically on site, with regard to you as an installer, the only thing that you need to do is, that you could recti rectify is point number one. Uh, point two and three, these, if these issues occur and they uh, cannot be rectified on start, then it simply means that the machine has to come in for uh, further inspection. Okay, so how do we rectify bus voltage one high? A bus voltage high, we're going to check the PV input, input voltage. But remember that the maximum PV input voltage must be less than 480. And when we say 480 here, it's open circuit. Okay, so that's your PV array setup without any load connected or the circuit is not closed, 
do not exceed 480, or it may cause the damage of the bus capacitors. The bus capacitors are situated on the MPPD board, uh, and it could damage that. Never exceed the MPV input limitation of the inverter. So we're going to look at 480 open circuit and about 380 closed. And then you're going to check the output current is limited. Both the DC side and the AC side could limit the output current. In scenario one, when the inverter works charging the battery, when, well, while it's charging the battery or in battery charging mode, and suddenly the battery cuts off its output, then the charge current won't disappear. So we have what's called a ripple current back to the, the, to the, the V bus one, right? So imagine the scenario. You've got PV generating and it's inverting from high voltage down to high voltage, low current. It's changing that to low voltage, high current to charge the batteries. And then all of a sudden you switch off the battery breaker. So that's a quick shut off of the output power. What we're going to do then is we're going to have a ripple current running backwards to the VBUS one. And that's scenario one, that that, re that reverse current won't disappear and it flows back to the bus link, which may cause the bus voltage high issue. The solution here is to make sure that the battery works properly and that you could limit the charge of the voltage and make sure it won't get charged over or overcharged. Sorry, the right, correct English is overcharged. But typically this could work in either the, the, the um, during the charging um, where the inverter is pushing out current, that either the breaker is inadvertently switched off, the breaker trips, or you could have a scenario where um, the battery instantly cuts off um, power because it doesn't have CAN communication. Then we will have a bus high voltage because uh, with CAN communication, remember that the voltage, the charge voltage is a stepped voltage. It steps up to bulk. And then uh, as the battery uh, reaches its, its uh, optimum voltage level, then the charge current will decrease and decrease and step down until it gets to maintenance or it shuts off. So that's critically what typically what we expect to happen. But if there's a rapid or sudden switch uh, uh, opening of the circuit, then we will have in scenario one, we will have a reverse current going back to the to the bus link. Scenario two, the battery's been fully charged and there is no EPS load consumption and the grid cell back is not allowed then there is no circuit for PV power to consume. It may cause the bus voltage to high issue. So, so typically what they're saying here is, or what the description is giving you is, there's you're not exporting, there is no load, you've got full PV and the battery suddenly gets to its fully charged level. Uh, it could possibly cause the bus voltage high issue. It doesn't typically happen, but it could be one of the causes. And that's what you're gonna look for as well. And in scenario three, the inverter works in hybrid mode, but the grid cell back is not allowed and there's no load comp compensation requirement and there's no relay open issue. The output current will be limited and may cause the bus voltage high issue. So um, uh, simple solution here, just make sure that there's load consumption. If possible, check if there is a relay issue. So this is the third scenario and the third scenario you'll see is very similar to the Second scenario, the only difference here being that the inverter is working in hybrid mode. Uh, grid sellback is not allowed and there is no load compensation requirement. Uh, then we will we could possibly also get this bus voltage high issue. Okay, so the, I, I like this, this uh, particular uh, um, uh, training that we're doing because it gives you the uh, installer as well as the tech support guys, it gives you a lot more information to work with. Um, where you could, you know, this this uh, workabout is certainly something that's going to help you uh, solve problems a lot better than simply just clicking firmware update. Okay, uh, bus voltage high. We're looking at so uh, if we so we're going to check if surge current or reverse current issue happens. If the, if there's grid power fluctuation issue or the reverse current issue in a parallel system, it also could cause a bus voltage high issue. And then obviously the solution here is if the grid power is not stable. Just go to backup mode. Or and also then in the parallel uh, setup, make sure that the parallel communication and EPS output connection are correct. We've gone through this in detail. Um, but the, those are also one of the things that could cause um, the bus voltage high issue. All right, warning number nine, uh, which is a fan stuck. Uh, it's quite a common thing. Uh, when I say quite a common thing, it's not a popular thing, but I mean, we do get a few of those in. It's a, there's a very quick workaround. 
Um, but if this warning does occur, um, after the, the, the fans of the comm board and the MPPT board work, the inverter will check the feedback signal from the fan every 20 milliseconds. And remember that these fans only come on when there is the MPPT fan will only come on when the inverter is uh, inverting PV power. It's either charging or providing load or whatever the case may be. But at night, the MPPT fan, which is the bottom, it's the, the single fan on the right. There are three fans. The, the fan one and two works on the DC and AC side and fan number three, which is on the far right, that works on the MPPT. So that one will only come on when the MPPT is working and it requires a feedback signal every 20 milliseconds when the fan speed is higher than 10%. The inverter will show a, a stuck fan when the feedback signal is high voltage level for more than 500 milliseconds. The simple thing is to remove it. The feedback signal is low and the voltage is low for one second. But, you know, we've seen this before. We, we have a fan stuck on one day and then the next day uh, it's gone and, uh, you know, the problem uh, doesn't occur again. But um, I, I encourage you guys not to really worry about the, the stuck fan issue um, because um, it's, a, it's a very simple fix. Um, and the fan control logic works like this, that when the charging or discharging power is higher than 300 watts, then both the left and the middle fans work. Remember I told you that the left and the middle are for the DC and the AC, uh, the DC to AC side. And when there is PV power higher than 300 watts or the load consumption is higher than 5,000 watts, then the right fan will work. So what it's basically saying is that the MPPD fan, even if in the absence of a PV, if the inverter should exceed five kilowatts, then the right-hand fan will come in, will work as well to assist with the cooling. Pretty cool. Okay, so step one, check if all the fan blades could be easily toggled. So basically for you as an installer, um, you're just going to make, just make sure that you can spin those fans by hand um, and make sure that there's nothing of inhibiting them from spinning. Sometimes if you turn them like this, you can feel if there's a bearing issue on them. Um, uh, we've had it before where guys have been working on the machine and a screwdriver has gone right up and hit the fan and broken off a fan blade and then we get an unbalanced fan, it wears off the bearing and eventually the fan will fail. Uh, so check the fan blades will be affected by lead wires while turning it on. So in other words, it's thing you hear that makes sure that there's nothing impeding the fans from turning. And then, then check if there's no obvious damage uh, uh, mark on the interface board. Sometimes, you know, the, 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 the MOSFETs on the interface board are normal. Um, so it's very difficult to see that because the, the interface board lies flat uh, like this. The fans are kind of over here. Uh, it's very difficult to see the, 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 the boards, but we do have a, there's a resistor on there and you can see, uh, sometimes you can see if one of the resistors are blown because these are drivers for the fans. Um, another a uh, way that you can do is on the interface board, you have, uh, there are, you can see where the fan wires come in and you can swap the two around uh, because the, the MPPT fan is driven off the MPPT control board, which, so that cable, the fan on the right hand side, that cable runs up to the top of the machine and it's driven internally, you can't see it. But the two, the middle fan and the left fan are driven off the interface board. Um, and if you have one of those fans not working, you can simply swap those cables around and see if they work in the opposite way. Then you will know if it's the fan that's a problem or if it's the interface board that's a problem. And then you can check the terminals and plug for fan control and you make sure that they're well connected and the terminals, and here we're talking about swapping the fan wire, fan wire plugs around to see if the control goes from, you know, follows the cable. All right, warning 13 over temperature and fault 25, uh, so uh, warning 13 occurs. Uh, you, you know, inside the machine, we have thermocouples. We've got a thermocouple on the main board on the left-hand side, which comes up to the to the DC to DC MOSFETs. We've, on, on either one of them at the top, we've got thermocouples that go uh, to just below the, um, uh, the, uh, the top end of the main board. And then on the MPPT, we've got two thermocouples there as well. So, um, so the, the temperature reading is, is so it's warning 13 will occur if the reading is higher than 87 degrees Celsius. And to remove it, obviously, the temperature has to drop below 85. And then fault 25 occurs when the temperature reading of the NTC is higher than 92, or there is an NTC open issue where the value will go to negative 25. So we could have failure on one of those uh, resistors that we use to measure the temperature. 
All right, and then to remove it, obviously, uh, it has to be below that, or we have to make sure that it's well connected. And here is a screen grab of the the uh, thermocouples. So the inner, it's not inner, but it's the inner. So it's the temperature of the inner PV1 temperature, and then T radiator is the temperature of the radiator on the DC to DC side, and then T radiator two is the inverted temperature. And T radiator three is zero, and then here we've got the VBAT PV2 temperature of 34. So these are actual um, readings that the resistors are giving us in degrees Celsius, right, for these various sampling points. So for you as an installer, if you have this, simply go to your to the maintenance page. I'm oh, sorry, to the maintenance page, go to the data page, go to data history, and then on the top. Uh, heading of that spreadsheet, just slide across until you get to these values here, and then you'll be able to see where your temp your high temperature warning or your over temperature warnings are coming from. Okay, right. So to uh, and here, there we go. Talking about the historical data, you see there's an NTC open issue. If the value is negative twenty five, then it simply means that the plugs come off, or it could be that the actual resistor has failed. Check if the temperature reading changes rapidly. The temperature decreases and increases rapidly, then it's possibly that the fan air duct is blocked. Remember that we've got fans uh, blowing air up into the machine, but it also has PVC ducting that runs on there. So we've got to make sure that the ducting, for the guys who do the repairs, make sure that the ducting is adequately fitted and that it's directing the air in the right direction. Just check if the air duct cover is inside and well installed, and if, if the temperature reading changes irregularly, then we could be the problem of the sampling circuit. And then the control board needs to be changed and to be checked again. Okay. All right, guys. So that brings us to the end of the training session. Uh, we've gone a little bit over time, 10 past 11, um, but we did start a little bit late. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the, the chat. There are no questions. Um, so, guys, thank you very much for joining uh, the training. It's been fantastic hosting it once again. This time around, I've kept my beanie on because I'm in Durban, and even here in Hillcrest, it is mad cold. I'm wearing a scarf uh, and a shirt over a shirt. Uh, but, guys, thank you very much for the for attending the training. Um, we have recorded the session, and we will uh, make this uh, training available uh, on our YouTube channel. If there are any questions, you can send us. Um, you can contact us via email. You can also contact, uh, contact us on the various support groups that we have. Um, you can reach out to us um, personally if you know how to get hold of us. Uh, we value your support. We value the sales that we get through you guys. Um, and Lux Power certainly wouldn't be the brand that it is today without you guys. So thank you very much for um, attending today. And I look forward to seeing you at our next training session. Thank you and goodbye.